So actually, since we're talking about that then, before we uh, dive in, we are, of course, a couple of weeks behind on the outline that I gave you. So what you should do is just keep up with the outline as it's written, and that way you'll always be ready for whatever book we're up to. So tonight we're just going to finish out 2 Corinthians, introduce and get started on Romans. We're probably, I, I cut it off at Romans 3, and I think even that's pushing it to get even that far. It's a, it's a classic, and it really is truly the most important letter in the New Testament to understand. So we'll be getting into that shortly, but in the meanwhile, uh, I did want to back up a little bit and slow down with 2 Corinthians. There's some really good stuff in here about apostolic ministry, what genuine fatherly leadership looks like in a local church, and it's really important for the hour that we're in. Well, it's always been important or it wouldn't be in the Bible, right? <laughs> but there's some things in there I think are really important because, well, I don't want to dive in. Let's pray first. <laughs> Let's, uh, why don't we just give God some thanks? For a minute and acknowledge the Lord in our midst rather than rushing doing a perfunctory prayer and then diving into teaching let's actually honor the Lord as he's with us right now go ahead and speak out your thanks or speak out your praise but let's just honor the Lord as he's here with us right now Jesus we worship you the word made flesh as a demonstration a walking demonstration of the love of God that you saw fit to write in what we call the Bible. But thank you for being an example and showing us what life looks like, and not just making us read about it. We give you thanks, Holy Spirit, for the way you make the Word come alive, even as you made it alive to the ones who wrote it in the first place. Thank you for making it alive to our hearts today that thousands of years later, your words as alive as if the ink was still wet on the page. Thank you for revealing continually the living word, Jesus Christ, every time we open up the written word. We give you praise tonight for the way we can encounter you, a living God, even tonight. We ask you, Lord, to inhabit the words of our mouth, though we might not be singing songs of praise right now. As David said, open my lips and my mouth will show forth your praise. So even the words that we speak tonight one to another, the words that we speak as we dive into your word and understand and reveal what the Spirit of God's saying, we pray that tonight you'll be praised in the words of our mouth and that you'll inhabit right on the words of our mouth tonight, even as we minister one to another. Well, we just thank you for the desire that you put on our heart to learn your word. Mm. We know more about you. Learn you is what we're doing, Lord. We just thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit confirming you were even with signs and, and miracles mm. and wonders in our next God. I thank you, Father, that there be any, uh, any needs that even amongst us that even your word would bring life and health to our flesh, God. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Father, for your presence here with us now. We just pray, Father, you will take full control and that you will lead God and direct in everything that's said and done. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. All right, so uh, if you have your notes from 2 Corinthians, pull those out and turn to that book, please. And we'll uh, we're back up back to chapter 10 and kind of slow, slow walk through. Not too slow. Still a survey level walk, but go through. What we saw last week was that Paul had already written 1 Corinthians, of course. He sent that with uh, Titus and Erastus. They came back with it, with uh, what, how the church had received it. And 2 Corinthians is a direct result of whatever Paul heard from Titus and Erastus, the ones who brought the first letter. So all of this, you can tell 
that Paul was still hearing some alarming things coming out of the church. And it appears that the biggest issue was that there was still some contention about Paul's relationship with the church. That there were those who had come in his absence and were pulling the hearts of the people of Corinth away from Paul. The ones that he'd sacrificed for, the ones that he'd laid down his life for, who founded them in Christ. I mean, this was a mega church and a booming port city. So uh, the four-way split that was going on was alarming, but now there were people that were trying to undermine Paul. So it looks like there were some other apostles, genuine apostles probably, teachers who were coming in. And for whatever reason, whether on purpose or not, some of them it appears were doing it on purpose, some probably just by virtue of how people are. We're all given to put people up on pedestals, right? I know I've been fighting against that for 15 years since I really, well, 20 years since I really came to a full revelation of what leadership in the body of Christ is really all about. It has nothing to do about being over the people. I know there are some leaders that believe that way, but even since coming to that revelation, it's a constant fight to stop people from saying, all right, you're, you're a holy man, you're pastors, you're apostles, you're prophets, you're one category of Christian, and then there's us, there's the rest of us. It's so embedded in the people and, and in all of us. So even, even ones who try to fight against that can find themselves doing that. So we're not judging the motives of these others. But their effect was to draw people away from Paul. So Paul's urging them, don't forget about me. Don't reject me. Does anyone here believe that that was for Paul's sake? Like, is Paul gaining anything out of this? Is he, like, man, I, I, you know, even if the accusation was made, and this is probably why Paul keeps reminding them, guys, I never even ask you for anything when I'm with you. I don't even ask you to feed me when I stay over there. I work with my own two hands as an example because I want you to understand, I'm not here to get something from you. I exist for your benefit. So this entire appeal, the heart of this appeal from Paul, is receive me for your good. I'm in anguish over you. I'm seeing what your lack of love has done. I'm seeing what your carnality is doing in your midst, and what's doing to the fellowship and the work of Christ in your midst. It's breaking my heart. So I'm eagerly trying, I'm trying to get back in. I'm trying to cause you to open your hearts back up again to me because you're going to collapse. You you guys are at risk of completely falling as a church. And I can help you with that. It's what a genuine father's heart is toward his prodigal children, toward those that are wandering astray. So that's Paul's heart. So he gives in these next three chapters, really for the rest of the letter, here's a good primer in spiritual authority. What spiritual authority is, and what it is not. I'm well aware, and I've sat under some teaching about spiritual authority that really is more geared toward making sure all the people know that the elders are in charge, or the pastor's in charge, or whoever is in charge of something. And the teaching goes so that there, there is somewhat of a feeling of, just make sure you remember your place. And that has nothing to do with spiritual authority. First of all, somebody in authority never has to remind anybody who's in charge. Genuine spiritual authority has an effect that nobody argues with. However, there are those who try to usurp God's ordained authority. So let's look at what spiritual authority is, what it isn't, and uh, how Paul really went about it. So Paul, in chapter 10, he gets into this whole thing about strongholds. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. So... Why do you think it is that he starts out? Why is he going after strongholds? Now, we understand in terms of inner healing, in terms of discipleship, that strongholds represent areas that we personally resist the Word of God and the power of God when it comes to us. These are ways of thinking. They are arguments that we trust in, and they can even cause us to reject God's Word when it comes to us. So why would Paul get into that, do you think? What's going on here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were clearly dealing with issues of pride, glorifying man, glor- you know, doing all these kind of things, trusting in their own ability, losing their love, even for one another. Absolutely. So their outward appearance could look like they were in control, but inside they were not. Yeah, they're a charismatic mess. I mean, on the outside, he said, you lack no gift. 
There's not a single spiritual gift that's not flowing in power whenever you gather together. But underneath that beautiful looking glorious exterior is a mess, a mess of carnality, a mess of selfishness, a mess of love, totally lacking in the midst. I mean, you got people getting drunk at your love feast. You got people in open fornication and nobody says anything about it. You're a mess when it comes to the fruits of the spirit, gifts of the spirit, no problem. So yeah, there was this appearance. So when Paul's describing spiritual authority, he's saying the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. What kind of carnal weapons could this leader have used to bring the Corinthian people back into their proper place, if you want to put it that way, under his leadership? Well, when I think of that, I think of like shaming somebody or mm-hmm. like manipulating them or trying to coerce them or, Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of what we do without Christ to other people. Like, you shouldn't have done that. And if you want people to, you know, I mean, just Mm -hmm. all that stuff we do as humans without Christ. So uh, they use a lot of words there, manipulation, control, threatening maybe, Mm -hmm. those kind of things. Yeah, those are carnal weapons. Do those ever do any good to actually change the inside of somebody? What's the result? If somebody does what you want them to do because of those things, what's their motive for obedience? Fear. Yeah, those all have one thing in common. They're rooted in fear. I'm afraid of being rejected. I'm afraid of what you might say to me. I'm afraid of being an outcast. Or uh, who knows what else, whatever fears drive like that. But there is no fear in love, right? Perfect love casts out fear. That's not how our kingdom operates. So I don't want to dive in too deep on what strongholds are about. I've taught on that before with you guys. But when Paul says, look, we are coming to destroy strongholds and we are ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. The statement being made is spiritual authority is evidence when there's a change of heart. That's how you know that there's genuine spiritual authority, not a change of behavior. This is parenting 101, right? We can make our little kids do whatever we want them to do because they're afraid of us. It doesn't seem like that sometimes. Like when your two-year-old looks up at you like this and goes, no, it doesn't seem like they're afraid, but deep inside they know, man, you could take me out. And and there is this thing. So as parents, we could, as Danny Silk puts it so well, we could yellow truck them. He's got this picture, this big yellow dump truck that ran over a little pickup truck. It was probably a big pickup truck, but compared to the big yellow dump truck, so the wheel's like eight feet high, and it just crushes this little thing. So we yellow truck people. We force them to do what we want them to do. That's not spiritual authority. That's a reflection of a leader or somebody in a genuine position of God-given spiritual authority who's insecure. I'm going to make sure that you know who's in charge around here. So... Um, True spiritual authority is evidence when there's anointing present that tears down strongholds. What's the real issue when it comes to, you know, obedience, if you like using that word? What's the real issue about that? Is it obedience to the leadership? What's really the goal of the church? Obedient to to the Lord, obedient to Christ. So we want hearts that are fully given over to the Lord. How do you know there's genuine spiritual authority present? Hearts are being given over to the Lord. Lives are being transformed. People are walking more closely with the Good Shepherd. That's how you know there's genuine spiritual authority, not some manipulative carnal kind of weapons being used, which only change behavior, not the heart. So that's what this is all about. So Paul's, this is another one of Paul's don't make me come down there statements. But not to threaten them into, hey, you better obey me or else. It's, look, I know that when I'm present, there's an anointing. There's an anointing God's given me. It's going to convert your heart. That's how you're going to know that I belong with you. Because from the inside, there's going to be weeping of repentance. There's going to be genuine transformation. Not because you're afraid of disappointing Paul, but because you've been reconnected to Christ. So I just want to make sure you got that, because that is a powerful little six verses right there. But they thought also that he's weak and when he's present with him, but he's strong in his letter. Yeah. So it's almost the opposite of what's really happened. Yeah. So why, why were they saying that? And this is what, you know, people said, you know, maybe Paul mumbled or, he, you know, he had like mush mouth or something like that, or he was a little frail old man or something like that. We don't know what he looked like or what he was like. He but, <clears throat> yeah, he definitely carried it in meekness, right? Well, that's why I think I put up there, meekness is not weakness. That's a mistake people make. 
because we judge externally. I yeah. put a little bit on that word when I was down in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Meekness. Meekness. It's, it's strength. It's uh, strength in... A harness? I can't remember that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's strength is what it is, but it's in uh, love. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a strength of, mm-hmm. I'm against you with this. You know? Yeah. It's meekness is like... Uh, really <laughs> yeah. So kind of like Paul. Yeah. <laughs> easy, easy going, but real with strength. Yeah. Amen. Under control, that's the word I was looking Strength for. under control. Yeah, I've heard it strength under a harness. Yeah. That you, you're strong like an ox. Mm-hmm. That ox is strong enough to bulldoze over whatever it wants to. But it's harnessed, so its energy is used for good. Right. And that's meekness. Um, okay, so then... Starting in verse 12, he starts with this, you know, we're not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those. So now he's going to compare, he's talking about, there's these other apostles here, right? Here's the deal with these other apostles. Here's what's going on. And he says, look, we're not going to boast or we're not going to grab hold of and take authority over. This is verse 13. We're not going to boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you for we're not over our, overextending ourselves in other words we're not <laughs> you guys are so cute they just traded glasses you can't see that on there but that was adorable my goodness <laughs> I'll find out what's going on with that later on where was I all right, so we're not overextending ourselves. In other words, Paul's saying, for me to communicate with you like this, for me to come and be in your midst and be like a father to you, is not stretching beyond what God has apportioned to me. So there's this concept, the Greek word used there for measure is the word metron. And it means a determined limit, like a portion that's been measured off to you. Uh, a stewardship that's been given by God. So you could liken it to a farmer's field. That farmer has authority over that field, not to boss the field around, but it's his stewardship. He's responsible to make sure that what grows in that field grows, that it's pure. If you're an organic farmer, you protect your field. You you keep chemicals off of it. You keep other things from getting planted in it. Why? Because you're a control freak? No, because you have responsibility for it. So a, a metron refers to a stewardship. It's something that God has given to us as a, a piece of responsibility. So what are some metrons that each of you has? What are some spheres of influence is another term we could use for it, which is something that God has given you that you know you're responsible to see to it that it bears fruit, which is really the heart of all leadership, all spheres of authority. It's not for the purpose of lording over something. It's for the purpose of I'm responsible for this because God gave it to me like a steward. So what are some... Words of knowledge that could be used. All right, the spiritual gifts that we have. Yep. What about areas of responsibility? Our Our families? Yep. Number one answer, I mean, every father and mother, that's your sphere, the house. Your household is your first sphere of influence. So... Do we do things as a father and mother because we like to control our kids as they suppose? (laughs) Or is it because we know that from the Lord we have a stewardship to have our home be a a place of peace, a place where the dove can settle? That's the entire motive of good godly parenting. I want my children to grow up in an atmosphere of heaven. So everything that interferes with that, I'm going to deal with because I'm responsible for this. I'll give an account before God. You know, this is the parable of the talents. I gave you this portion. Now, what did you give me in return? That's, that's what this is all about. So what else? We got our families. What other things? Workplace. Our workplace. Yeah. Whatever measure of authority you've been given. If you own the business, if you're a manager, or if, even if you work, whatever has been given to you is a responsibility. That's your sphere of influence. You have authority in it. What else? I would say like myself with the gift of hospitality, it's my responsibility to make sure that people feel welcome and are mm-hmm. loved on. Yeah. Whether I feed them or however, mm-hmm. you know, just sit and converse with them. Yeah. Well, you carry it well like that. You're a great example, Karen. You carry a gift, and when God's given you opportunity to do it, you pour your heart into it because you feel the sense of responsibility. God gave me a gift and a grace. And it's for a purpose. It's for the purpose of benefiting those who will, who will be blessed by that hospitality. Hi. Hi. Yes. I mean, 
couldn't it, it, when I'm thinking about the way that you describe that, I mean, to me, it's almost like whoever God would bring to us at any given time, like, because you could interact with anybody God, so, sometimes you know when God brings someone into your life, you might not stay in a relationship with them for long, but mm -hmm. God brings them there, and it, it's our responsibility to yes. grab hold of those moments, and mm -hmm. even if it's just being responsible for the way we we act and show Christ to that person, mm -hmm. I mean, it could be, or meet a physical need of that person, or that's good. Whatever, but I mean, yeah. So I would define that as you're being a good steward of Christ in you, who has ministry that he wants to pour out. I'm stewarding that by being faithful to pour it out whenever it's mm -hmm. there. How about ourselves, mm -hmm. our own self? Yeah. This is responsibility 101. I am first of all my own metron. I'm responsible for my life. Now as a steward of the mysteries of Christ, a steward of Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm responsible for that. So I'm responsible not to allow you to affect that. I'm, not, I'm responsible not to let your sin get in the way of me stewarding Christ in me and growing and keeping my love on, as Danny puts it. I'm responsible for that. So that's, a, that's another powerful, that's our first metron really, even before our family. I'm responsible to keep myself as a father, a husband, a pastor before the Lord and steward myself. Then I'll have to give to everybody else. Like Stephanie was saying, to anybody that God would bring into our path, we should you know, show that to or whatever we need to do at the moment. But, but the Bible does say to you, you never know when you could be entertaining an angel. That's right. That's a good motivator. Mm -hmm. if you get, <laughs> come on in. I always do that just in case. I've heard some awesome stories about that, but all right. So, um, so here's the, the bottom line with this whole spheres thing is that what Paul's really getting at, first of all, the revelation of we each have a sphere, but it's also honoring the spheres of others. So classic example is we have prophets and teachers who come in here to minister in the church and the ones who come, one of the things I value in them is when they come, even ones who are my seniors in Christ, sometimes old enough to be my parents, but who will say, hey, I'd like to share something about this. Do you teach that here? Do you agree with that here? I've had some, and I kind of smile, you know, let them finish their statement about, do you guys have women as leaders in your church? Because they, they're so honoring, they don't want to bring division. It's not their field. Now, they might, if, for example, if I didn't believe women should be ordained, all of the ones in a relationship might pull me to the side afterward and say, what's up with that? You want to open the Bible? And, you know, we might talk in private, but never to sow those seeds, because what will those seeds end up being? Division. Seeds of discord and division, right? Even the truth of God's Word, when you sow in a field that doesn't belong to you, without the permission of the one who's been given that as a sphere, you just sow discord even by preaching the truth of God's Word. So it's really important that we honor that. And that's really what Paul was about here. There were others sowing into the field that he established, all kinds of other stuff, and it confused the church and brought a four-way split into a church that Paul had sacrificed for. So, all right, any questions about that? Metrons and all that? So guard that sphere, take responsibility for it, and just know that you've got an anointing for it, and your anointing's not, these aren't carnal weapons. <clears throat> you have anointing and power to tear down the strongholds, everything that's resisting God's rule in that area. Like, you know, the kingdom of heaven, we have the, the, that's, what we, that's really what we're all about is the kingdom of heaven. It's the king's dominion. So wherever you are assigned a sphere, that's a portion you're responsible to see that the king's dominion comes into that place. All right, awesome. So chapters 11 and 12, Paul's going to compare. Here's what true apostles look like. This is what it really, really happens. And the first comparison he'll make really is humility versus self-promotion. That seems to be what some of these guys were doing. So... What was happening, verse 3, he really gets into it. He says, look, your minds are being led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You all remember what Paul was about in the letter to the Galatians? That there were other things being added in, some dead religious ideas, some law of Moses. Uh, do the Judaizers are at work? There were other heresies also at work that we'll get into when we get to John. But these other things that made Christ complicated again. 
So that was one of the things that Paul was alarmed about, that some of these other apostles were teaching things that were bringing religion into the church. He said, look, my heart for you, always my message is to bring you back to the simplicity of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit, you walk with Jesus, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's, that's faith, and that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> so <clears throat> these other ones, though, were promoting themselves, coming with credentials and all of this. So Paul says, all right, you want a comparison? I'm going to compare myself then, if you insist with those who are coming to you with their commendations, with their plaques on the wall and their degrees and all this kind of stuff. Let me, let me share with you what my credentials are. Are they anything like, anything like what the others were doing? This was my favorite couple of chapters about Paul and what really made me fall in love with the man and believe that Paul's the best Christian who's ever lived apart from Christ himself. Because... His bragging that he's about to do. He's like, all right, these guys came bragging about what makes them great apostles. I'm going to brag a little bit too. Let me brag about my weaknesses. So, you know, he said, look, I'm jealous for you. Here's that heart of him over his metron, right? This area of responsibility. I have an eagerness with a godly jealousy because I betrothed you to one husband that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. I, I'm like a father with his virgin daughter protecting her purity for her husband. That's the zeal that Paul has. I want to prevent you. I'm going to, those wolves, the, you know, the, <laughs> the ones that, as Paul said to the Galatians, I wish they'd just cut themselves off. All these other ones who are trying to rob you of this beautiful love relationship you've been walking in right now. I'm jealous over you, not for my sake. You know, jealousy is an attribute of God, right? Yeah. We always think jealousy is a bad thing, but it's not. I'm je- my wife, I'm jealous for my wife. She can't, no man can have her. She's mine. Mm-hmm. Sorry, guys. That is my woman. Mm-hmm. I am one flesh with her. You can't have her. I am jealous over her, which means I know that she belongs to me, and I value her, and I will protect her. I will lay down my life to protect our oneness. That's how much. So Paul's jealousy over the church is that I know what we are. One another, I will sacrifice my life for you. I'm jealous about you. Not jealous in like a teenage, you know, middle school kind of way where I'm mad because you're talking to somebody else. Not that. That's not what jealousy is. Jealousy is I understand who you are to me and who I am to you. I'm going to protect that relationship at all. That's what this is about. So then he gets into his thing. Here it is. He said, look, I, uh, let me share with you what happened starting in verse 18. Many boast according to the flesh. Let me boast about my, my, my flesh. You know what my flesh is in for? I have, uh, I have, have uh, first of all, I'm in Israelite too. Just like these Judaizers. I am a of Abraham. I am a servant of Christ. I am far more time in prison than just skiers. So, right, I'm in the flesh. I'm a Pharisee. I'm, a, I'm an Israelite, just like these other guys. So, uh, most people, me included, believe that the ones who were really disrupting the church were Judaizers, trying to bring the law and bring works of the flesh back in Christ. So, here in verse 23, all right, they're servants of Christ. I speak as if I'm insane. I'm uh, more so. I labor harder than any of them. I've been in prison far more times. I've been beaten more times. I've been in dangers of death. Five times I've, been, I've received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Remember in the Passion of the Christ, the, the first thing that they did when they put him over the post, that's beaten with rods. So it, it's like a, a stick that's a whip. Beaten with rods three times. I was stoned three times shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night floating out at sea after a shipwreck. I've been in frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship, I've had sleepless nights, been in hunger and thirst without food and cold and exposure. And on top of all that, every day, you're on my heart. And all of these things on top of me daily comes the pressure of concern for all the churches. So you want to know what my credentials are? There they are, folks. That's why I'm an apostle. That's the heart of leadership right there. 
I know I put this out as a shepherd and as a leader, that if any leader won't put himself out like that for the flock, then he's not modeling after the good shepherd and that is not a leader that I would trust with the people of God. That's a hireling, not a shepherd. So you think of Paul Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he is a tough dude. He, he's a, I can't think of any words that I can say out loud about him. He's just really, he's a tough dude. <laughs> he's a bad, oh no, I can't, he's a, he's a bad dude. <laughs> you don't mess with him. I mean, he's no mamby-pamby, quiet little rabbi. He's totally opposite of uh, verse 13 of who they are. For such a false pop. Apostles, deceitful, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Yeah. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Mm -hmm. so that's, Amen. That's just total opposite of what Paul is. Yeah. So then really when it comes down to it, the credential for leadership, the qualities of leadership, or your willingness, your willingness to sacrifice for God's people, your willingness to endure whatever you need to for the sake of the ones you love. What parent doesn't understand what that's all about? Right? We would do anything for our kids. We would work crazy jobs at crazy hours. We would step in front of a bullet, step in front of a moving car. We would do anything to protect our kids for love's sake, right? So that's, what's that? <laughs> Almost anything. <laughs> all right, so, so any questions about that? So there isn't boasting about his weaknesses. You want me to boast? I'll boast about how weak I am. There, I trapped you. <laughs> One thing with the, back in that verse that says about the simplicity of the gospel. Um, oh, yeah. Once when I was doing a teaching about um, Genesis 1 and 2 with the trees, it says about the simplicity there. And simplicity is a singleness. Mm. And... Uh, just as they reference Eve here in this passage, it's like singleness mm. in the garden. The tree of life was a single tree. The, the other tree was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mm. And, and Jesus was wow. meant to be our covering, not anything else. And so it was going, you know. Mm. And then I brought in the example of like with a husband and wife. It's like if you live with your wife and, it, and you are the covering, everything is simple. But <laughs> what happens if you go outside to... Mm. seek others you know marriage doesn't become so simple anymore it's, yeah. it's, it becomes a lot more difficult and just like in Paul's mm. example like he paid the price for them and that's why he's saying it's like you know mm. I, I've been your covering I've paid the price for you you know don't go outside that wow that's awesome yeah I never heard it put that way before that was powerful amen all right, so that's boasting about all the things that have happened to him. Here's my proof of why I deserve to be your leader. All right, so now chapter 12. Let's go on to visions and revelations. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was taken up into the third of heaven. How many of you believe that was Paul and he was just being shy about it? Yeah. <laughs> it seems like Paul's way. I know somebody. I don't need to brag about myself, but I know somebody who's taken up into heaven. It, either way, his point is it's no big deal. That's not an experience that gives me the right to speak into your life. The fact that I've been taken up into heaven and saw things like John and Revelation and like many others have had of the experience, that's not what qualifies me to speak to you. So it's like he takes it outside himself. And I'll brag about some other dude who got taken up like that because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what supernatural crazy stuff goes on around me. I mean, he did say later on, right, all the signs of an apostle were done among you. So there were healings, there were miracles, there were there is a supernatural manifestation. He's not suggesting that it's all just natural stuff. But then right away he switches gears back in and he's going, I'm gonna talk about my thorn in my flesh now. Because if you think that other stuff was bad, check this out. What's his point with that? Why did he <laughs> why did he go and start talking about a thorn in his flesh, this whole thing? Why why do you think he got into that? What's his point? Kind of to say, like, with, with all that I'm going through, it's because there's so much there that God has given me, and he's also, like, this good stuff. And so he's also given me this thorn that he's not going to take away because I'm giving you all this good stuff. You're going to have some of my suffering. Mm -hmm. 
the benefit of my suffering. The benefit of my yeah. suffering, yeah. Mm -hmm. The benefit of my suffering. <laughs> yeah. 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 To teach him this is, this is my way, suffering. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, and I think um, adding on to that, it's like he had this thing that, you know, was always going to be there, but it's like that is, to me, like the most supernatural thing that God does for us is <sighs> give us the grace to, mm. you know, he, he's living with this. Yeah. But it, he's not just living with it. He's thriving with it. But it's, you can only do that supernaturally. Mm -hmm. We're just not built that way as humans. Yeah. So it's like that is like the mm -hmm. perfection of what God does. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you can have something that you can't change, but he can like every day give you enough grace to not yeah. be slave to it. Amen. That's amazing. That's good. That's amazing. Yeah. That thorn grew in the flesh too, I think, was to keep him humble and dependent on God so that he didn't get prideful and humble. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. This opens up some fun cans of worms, I feel, to open up right now. <laughs> Who gave Paul the thorn in the flesh? Where'd that come from? Satan. Satan. Okay, it was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. The word buffet literally means to beat him with bodily blows, like a boxer would. So some have speculated it was some kind of physical disorder or something like that. Some have said that it was a messenger, an angel can also just mean somebody who speaks or preaches, a false apostle whose words were so sharp and cutting that Paul felt the agony of the effect on the churches, and that was what the thorn in the flesh was. Nobody knows for sure exactly. He was a little, a little mysterious about it. But it says that it was, there was given me a thorn in the flesh because of the abundance of revelations, right? Mm -hmm. So they, Paul understood the reason for it. From revelation from God, from his own just speculating and knowing. So was it Satan that gave it? Or was it God who gave it? I mean, you've said Satan because it was a messenger of Satan. Does God send messengers of Satan to buffet his children? He allows it. He allows it. But he allows it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm just, I want you to think. I need to make you think about this because some have looked at this passage and said, see, God, God sends demons to train his kids. Good and perfect gifts come mm -hmm. from above. That's right. Mm -hmm. What? Job. The story of Job again. That's perfect. It allowed, it God allowed Job, or Satan to come in and say, to test Job for a reason. And so, if he does it for Job, why would he not do it for anybody else? <coughs> who, you know, yeah. has the potential for the kingdom. You mm -hmm. know? And God's like, okay. And so God says, God allows Job to, you know, get rid of his, his pain for a while. When, in the end... But then Paul's like, no, let's keep this thorn forever while he's on earth. <laughs> yeah. And see what happens, you know? Yeah. See what cool Maybe. Get from it. He might have, or I, personally, I think the devil finally gave up. <laughs> After what Paul says, I think the devil's like, well, I ain't going to work. Anyway, but yeah, I'm really grateful for the book of Job, though a lot of people like to skip over it because it's just a lot of whining and stuff and a lot of, like, that was dumb. Why would you say that to your friend, man? He just lost his everything. And you're going to shame him. Okay, thanks, friend. You know, it's just a lot of that. But just that little revelation into the heavenly is that God, that, that this, the enemy, mm -hmm. the devil, is still a pawn in God's plan. That even the best laid plans of the enemy to destroy us, what the enemy intends for evil, that God's always able to one-up and put him in checkmate and use it for glory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even Paul, he's like, all right, three times I pleaded with God that he would take this thing away from me. So he's bragging to the Corinthians about how God didn't answer his prayer. <laughs> Think about that. God did not hear my cry in terms of answering it according to what I wanted. I wanted this issue out of my life. But I pressed in. I didn't abandon God. I let, him do, I let the enemy do this work. So it's almost like, you know, God with Job, Satan and Job... He's like, all right, Satan, you could do it, but you're going to regret it. I'm telling you, 
all you're going to do is form a more perfect weapon to fight against you in the earth with whatever you intend to do with my son. Because I'm not going to let you take his life. I'm going to put parameters around what you're allowed to do. The same kind of parameters that a coach would put on the ones he's training to make sure that at the end of the training, he's going to come out ready for the fight. So for Paul, he said, so what Jesus said to me was, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, I'm going to give you all the grace you need. I'm not going to remove the issue, but I am going to give you grace, which means you're not going to suffer every day of your life. That's a misunderstanding. Paul didn't suffer every day of his life because of this. This wasn't, you know, a painful whatever that, that you know, incapacitated him. He said, no, I'm going to give you grace. You're going to have the issue with my grace, and you're going to learn something about supernatural living that you didn't know before. This is the grace that's going to cause you to live above the problems that you have in your life. Whatever the physical, emotional, whatever the issue is, you're going to live on top of that thing even if I don't take it away. And what you're going to discover is, Paul said, most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So I'm well content with weakness, insults, distress, persecution, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now you're the devil. What are you going to do with that one? You just threw your worst at him, and he's celebrating it. That's like somebody being tortured who looks up at the guy torturing him and just laughs in his face. <laughs> That's the best you got? I don't think Paul said that, but he's like, I'm not. I, I, I realize something now. All God did was reminded me of the principle of everything to do in Christ. Apart from Him, I can do nothing. So the more I'm aware of that fact, the more power is going to flow out of me because I'm not doing the Paul thing anymore. I'm doing the Christ in Paul thing now. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of um, how it says, you know, abide in me, you know, and, and just like the picture of God gave me the picture just now of like Paul just climbing into his giant hand and oh, yeah. you know, just cupping him like this. And, and that's what he, yeah. that's what he does. And what, that's the most amazing way to live when you know on your mm-hmm. own, you have something that is there, but somehow miraculously when you climb into God's hand, it just doesn't matter. Amen. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, so there it is. So, anything else about, yeah? I was just going to say, dealing with some physical stuff that I go through, and um, I've been doing just communion every day, and that's, like I was telling um, Brianna, like she said, we'll try this, try that, whatever. And I said, I haven't felt any different by trying some different things. I still feel the pain every morning, you know, I still, but by having communion, it's a constant reminder, Mm -hmm. and God speaks to me in that. So I feel like I'm above the circumstance and not Mm -hmm. underneath the circumstance. Amen. 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 That's awesome. I think that's what Paul also says there. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But it's just taking right from the promise. He believed that promise that Jesus said to him. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. In your weakness. So mm-hmm. I, I feel it was a, something of weakness that he had, whether it be physical or another weakness of some kind that mm-hmm. he was oppressed with. So he was yeah, I can't wait to ask him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it, Paul? Come on, thorn in the flesh. Why couldn't you explain that metaphor? I think if we well, can grab a hold of the that God has a purpose and plan in, in everything mm-hmm. and not to look at the circumstances. It's a, I think of like when Jesus called the 12. He knew Jesus. Judas was a thief. Yeah. But he still called him. Yeah. He had a purpose in the plan. Jesus was God in yeah. the yeah. To me, Judas was just part of his plan. Mm-hmm. Of Amen. Salvation, you know? Yeah. Somebody yep. had to do the dirty work. <laughs> You know, yeah. That thorn in the flesh, without him explaining what it could be, we could use that metaphor for so many different types of things. If he would have said what that was, people would just focus on that one. Thing. That's true. Thank you, Paul, for not explaining it. Yeah. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going to ask him, though. <laughs> no, you're right, though. All right, so then. Uh, I don't know if that's the right question. Oh, yeah. Okay. With Joe, what if he would have failed? 
If Job would have failed? Yeah, I mean, other than not getting the book written about him. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have made it into the Bible. It would have been just, yeah. yeah. I mean, it clearly says, and God clearly says, he didn't bring it on himself. Yeah. But, but what if he didn't have enough strength? What, what if... If he would have uh, collapsed? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're right. He wouldn't have been in there. Is that a sin? Did he sin if he failed? Oh, you mean like if he would have cursed God, as yeah, Satan yeah, said, like, take everything away, he'll curse you to your face, was the accusation yeah, Satan made. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if he would have followed his wife's counsel. I love Job because of that. The poetic justice of the book of Job is my favorite yeah, thing about it. Because his wife, the one who said, you know, curse God and die, Job got double everything he lost, so she got to give birth to another ten kids. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Anyway, <laughs> so I think to... God said he could touch everything in his life except for his own life. Yeah. He didn't take his wife. And there's a reason for that. Because he needed more kids afterward to get restored. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's right. No, I think overall, I think, uh, I think to answer your question, though, Job, uh, Job, Joel, about Job, <laughs> the... Uh, you know, in the sovereignty of God, God sees the end from the beginning, and he knew that Job could handle that, that Job would not curse God, that he wouldn't, you know, shake his fist at God. He had questions galore throughout the book. So God, what's going on? Why this injustice doesn't seem right? But he never once accused God. That was the accusation Satan made. You, you take away his stuff. He only loves you because you bless him. Take away his stuff, and he'll be like everybody else. He'll curse you to your face. And uh, God knew and his seeing the end from the beginning, that Job could withstand that test. He probably would have said no to Satan for someone else. Well, it first says that Job was a righteous man. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I hate it when people read the book of Job and they're always looking for Job's fault. See, he thought he was self-righteous. No, God's testimony was that he's a righteous man. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with that one. Exactly. You go find fault with him if you want to, but uh, you couldn't handle half of what he got. Go ahead. I know it's not about Job, but don't you think, I feel like God is such a, he wasn't testing Job, though. You know, like the enemy, yeah. the enemy right. was essentially testing Job, and I think, I don't know about anyone else, but I, I think I fail, have failed many times in my life, you know, throughout my walk with the Lord and responding the right way, but mm -hmm. God's character is like, he he is a god of restoration and his goal is to reconcile us fully to him so i mean i feel like if job i don't i don't even know if failure is how god views us you know i think of the verse in psalms where it says he knows we're dust you know he knows that we're yeah we you know mm -hmm. and i just think he's merciful and the things that we do like at least in my experience that i fail god often just uses that as like another mm -hmm. like a, no, absolutely. a piece of the like, like you I'm, fail forward into it his might take longer glory. to get to the restoration and reconciliation because I'm so stubborn but mm -hmm. it's always his goal I don't think he would have yeah. uh, thrown Job to the curb and been like oh well too bad Job no. he messed up this time I don't know that's just, yeah. I just don't think that's who he is amen all right I'm trying to move forward so we can get into Romans before we leave today. I've got to do something because I want to finish the New Testament with y'all. <laughs> All right, so um, he expresses his love concern, and I just wanted to capture this phrase over here because I love, this is a statement that every leader, regardless of what it is, or every fatherly type leader should be able to say, I don't seek what is yours, but I seek you. I'm not looking to get anything from you. I love you. I'll most gladly spend. I'll even be expended. I will go to my last drop. I'll leave it all on the field, as we say, for your <laughs> sake, for your souls. I'm so eager to see you whole in Christ. Like you said to the Galatians, I'm like a woman in travail of labor right now until Christ is fully formed in you. That, that kind of passionate love for the people of God ought to be present in anybody. Who wants to minister and lead to the people of lead the people of God? Um, all right. Anything? Uh, anything else you saw in Second Corinthians? I'm ready to move on. Unless you had any questions or insight 
something the Lord spoke to you that you wrote in your notes there as you were reading that you want to share with everybody? All right, Romans it is. Woo-hoo! We made it. We're only two weeks behind now. <laughs> All right, so in preparation for Paul's visit to Rome, Paul already, I'll show you in a moment, had in his heart that he was going to Rome. Paul sent a letter ahead fully explaining the gospel of grace, church, everything that Paul taught really is kind of summarized in Romans. Some have called it like the Christian manifesto. And it, it definitely comes across that way. The letter is written at a higher level of Greek than any of his other letters. And most people believe because he used the scribe who probably helped him write in more eloquent terms. That's why it can be a little hard to understand because he was writing to some of the most well-educated people in the world at that time. The city of Rome was like, it, it was it. It was the center really of the, the whole world at that point. Um, it's a classic. It's just an absolute gem of a letter. So I want to introduce it and then we'll get as far as we can into it this week. But Paul, just setting some history behind it and the context of it. I want you to grab hold of some things as you finish reading through the letter this week. But he had a prophetic call to Rome. Paul already knew, I'm going to Rome. In Acts 19, after the revival in Ephesus, which preceded the riot in Ephesus, and that usually they both are right next to each other in the scriptures and in life. And when Paul came to town, it was going to be a riot or revival. You never knew which way, depending on the day, what was going to happen. That's the sign that the kingdom has come. Because it upends principalities and powers. They get all upset. They wig out and, you know, they do crazy stuff. Like we've seen a lot of crazy stuff in Washington because I believe God's been upending some things and there's some principalities being disruptive. So although on the natural it looks like a mess, in the supernatural it's the chaos before God creates something new. Uh, so anyway, I didn't I don't know where that I wasn't prepared to say that, but that's what God's doing. I'm telling you right now, there was chaos before God spoke order into creation, and uh, there's chaos in our nation right now before God speaks a new order, and it's not the new world order like <laughs> Huxley's 1984 or anything like that. It's it's God's order. There's going to be an incredible outpouring and revival in our nation. So that's what it was like in Ephesus. There was, you know, the people were burning their books and potions and all that kind of stuff. And when that happened, Acts 19.21, Paul said, after these things were finished, the revival, people repenting and burning their witchcraft stuff and pagan idols, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia. So that's uh, Philippi all the way down into Corinth. So that whole, all the places he established on his second trip. He purposed in his heart to go there first, then to Jerusalem. And then he said, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So already right now, while Paul is in Ephesus, in the middle of his third missionary trip, he already knows by the Spirit, I've got Rome in my sights now. We've conquered Ephesus. For Paul, it was kind of like, remember when David shared his credentials with King Saul? And he was trying to convince him how this young man could go up against a nine-foot warrior who'd been a warrior since he was a child. And he said, this isn't my first rodeo, by the way. Man, I was out there watching my sheep, and I killed a lion, and then a bear tried to take him. I killed that bear. I can handle Goliath. I've got experience in this. I don't want to get too deep down this road, but the, whole, the way we teach David and Goliath is all off. Mm-hmm. David had already been working up a resume in the spirit. And he'd been practicing for this very day. He didn't just show up like some little kid with a slingshot, like the pictures in the kids' Bibles. That bothers me so much. He'd been practicing for this. He was born for it, and God had been preparing him for it. Just like that, Paul's being prepared. Conquered F, saw it, conquered the teacher. Now it's time for him. Because F is in full and the church is established. They're well on the way. Mission accomplished. Hmm? started the Roman church. Well, there were other believers there but already. We don't know. Okay, there so were like in Corinthians. I mean, he's claiming the fatherhood of that. Church. Yeah. But in Romans, he's coming you know, to visit them, and I was just wondering who who established the church. That, mm-hmm. so it's, no, that's a great question. Yeah, this is the first letter Paul wrote to a church that he didn't establish, and he never even met them. I mean, there were some people, as you see at the end, he says, "Say hi to so and so for me, and greet so and so for me." So there were some people there. But historically, we know that as of 57 AD, when Paul wrote this letter, there were already five congregations in Rome and roughly 3,000 plus believers 
in Rome that's recorded outside the scriptures in history. That's interesting because <laughs> earlier in his letters he said he didn't want to have to build on other people's yeah where other people started. Yeah, what's well, how he puts it uh, to them is I want to have some fruit among you, mm-hmm. not lay a foundation among you. I'm coming so that I can impart some spiritual gift that you might be established. And also because, man, I'd like to have some fruit in Rome. But look, other people have been there already. We don't know which apostles. Most people don't believe Peter had been there yet. So Paul might have been the first you know, real one of the 12 level apostles to get there. But Peter may have already come. We don't know. But uh, So yeah, the scripture doesn't say who established the churches, but there were churches there already. So um, the next three years, which you're going to read about after we finish Romans, are Paul's long and windy road to Rome. Or you could say long and windy road to Rome, if you know the story. I just saw that. That's funny. I didn't do that on purpose, but that's funny right there. You'll see why that's funny. Trust me, it's funny. All right, so look at Romans 15 for a second, because I want you to grab the history here of what's going on. Romans 15, at the end, he says a few things about his heart and desiring to visit them. And he's got plans. The man's got plans. The man already knows by the Spirit, or he has just things in his heart. He's got his sight set on Spain. Rome's not his final destination. He's like, I'm, I'm going to get all the way to the, is there an ocean out there? I'm going to go as far as, man, as far as, uh, what's his name, Jonah tried to run from God. I'm going to take the gospel that far. So he's like, Rome's just a pit stop. And he, the way he says it to them is, I want to come, and then you're going to support me in my trip to Spain. You're going to pay my way, right? And you catch, you'll catch it when you read. So he, he says this, um, I'm going to start in verse 22, right? For this reason, I've often been prevented from coming to you. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, But now, with no further place for me in these regions, so he's speaking from Asia. He's been there three times already. Ephesus is in revival. All of Asia has heard the word of the Lord. So there's nowhere for me to go here anymore. I've been for many years longing to come to you. So verse 24, whenever I go to Spain... For I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I first enjoyed your company for a while. So in other words, start taking an offering because you're going to pay my way to Spain. Um, But now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. Remember the collection? That's what he's speaking about. So he's in Corinth when he writes the letter to the Romans. He's in that city and we'll see why in a moment. And he's describing this collection that we're taking. Right? That was the two chapters on New Covenant giving. You know, the Lord loves a hilarious giver, uh, that whole section. And it almost he kind of jokingly shames them into, hey, you know, they're offering up in Macedonia where they're much poorer than you. They're out giving you. You don't want that to happen. You know, all you wealthy Corinthians. So he does his whole offering contest with them because he wants to be a blessing when he goes to Jerusalem. Some Maybe to buy favor? Like he's going to come with all kind of gold when he shows up at Jerusalem. He might get a little bit warmer welcome than he's gotten there before. Who knows? But anyway, that's what he's talking about. I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. I'm going to bring some uh, money to them from Macedonia and Achaia. Have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So um, anyway, that, that, so that's his heart. He's already got his sight, sight set on there. I'll go to you by way of Spain. Oh, I'll go by way of you to Spain. A little geography update there. Um, and I know I'm going to come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ when I come. So that's his plan. That, that's where he's going. So here he is. Um, he's already, he, he wrote 2 Corinthians up here in Macedonia in a few months after the writing of the letter, which he sent by Timothy's hand this time. It's, uh, this is another study to do. Check out what Paul used Titus for and what Paul used Timothy for. They're the two right-hand men that he used the most. And uh, I think what you'll see is Titus was like his axe man. Titus was the, the dude who would go in, like he's in Crete, this island full of foul-mouthed fishermen. And that's where Titus gets to go. And Timothy goes back to Ephesus, the happy, clappy saints, you know, where, where Paul's established a church. But anyway, he sends Timothy with the letter, and then he follows and he spends some time with them. So they didn't kill him. So he was well-received when he got there. And while in Corinth, he wrote the letter to the Romans. Now, you've read part of Romans. When you read all of Romans, you'll probably see why he chose here to send the letter rather than going back to Antioch to send the letter. Why do you think that is? In Romans, the basic message to the Jew is, I don't care what country you're from anymore. In in Christ, Jew and Gentile are one. 
We're alike. And by the way, Israel is not just biological Israel. You ain't even a Jew until you're born again. So that's the message of Romans. If they read that letter back here in Jerusalem, before he came, he'd be torn limb from limb as soon as he entered the city. In fact, his preaching of this kind of stuff had already gotten him in so much trouble that it says, did you catch this? When he wanted to leave here, it says he wanted to go to Syria, back home to Antioch. But there was a plot against him. This is where intrigue gets in. Somebody needs to make a really good movie about this. So instead of hopping on a ship where the dagger men, the, there were these assassins that were waiting for him. They knew that he was going that way, so he didn't get on the boat. He traveled back up through Macedonia, back around, met with the elders at Ephesus. And then he went to Jerusalem, which you'll read about in a couple of weeks. That was fun. That was another riot, literally, for Paul. So from here, he sends the letter. It was probably safer to send it that way. Not only so he wouldn't get in trouble with all the Judaizers back home in Jerusalem, but it's a shorter trip, less likely that that... Imagine there's only one copy of it. They couldn't photocopy it before he left. There's no time for some scribe or monk, there weren't no monks yet, to copy it all over. That classic letter could have been lost entirely if it didn't make it. So from Corinth, it's a shorter trip to Rome. They brought it to the church and they thrived uh, that way. So it was cheaper postage. And uh, so that's why he sent it from Corinth. So, um, so, that's, so, so he spent probably, I mean, it's a classic letter. He probably gave it a good little bit of time. So let me give you an update. You guys have your timeline that I gave you at the beginning? We're now in 57, the year 57. So we're way over here. We're almost to the end of the book of Acts timeline. Acts ends in the year 60 AD with Paul under house arrest in Rome. That's how the book of Acts ends. So we're getting pretty close. We're only three years out from the end of the book of Acts when Paul wrote Romans. He's been in ministry already for uh, at least 25 years or more. Uh, it's been 27 years since the resurrection of Jesus. We only have 13 years left until the temple is destroyed by Rome and Jerusalem is completely sacked and burned to the ground. Um, there are, so far... There's no empire-sanctioned persecution of the church. That's coming, but none of that began until after the book of Acts. So all the persecution we read about, it was first from the Jews in Jerusalem. Saul was a part of that. Then it was from Herod and the local authorities. But so far, any persecution's only been by the Jews. There's been no empire-sanctioned persecution of the church. Nero will do that for the first time four years after the book of Acts ends in the year 64, and we'll get into that next time. So Nero's on the throne. Nero is now emperor of Rome, and I know that right away, as soon as you think of Nero, you think he's nuts. They all were nuts. I mean, every, from Augustine all the way on out, Augustus, they were all crazy, and that's kind of what happens when you think you're God. I guess it just kind of gets to your head, and it explodes. But he was 17 years old in the year 54 when Nero began his reign. He was young, and he was pliable. It's actually one of the tragedies of history because his mentor, Seneca, you might have heard that name, he was a famous senator of Rome, really wise man, really as godly as a pagan can get kind of man. And while Nero sat under his tutelage, he was doing really well at ruling the Roman Empire, even moving it back toward being more like a republic. So decentralizing the power of Rome, it could have been a great turnaround for Rome in that day. But Nero, the whole thing about you're a son of the, son, the gods and all that finally got to his head. He had Seneca killed and he had all his family killed and he was a madman after that. But while Paul's writing to the Romans, and even while Paul was in prison the first time, things were pretty peaceful in Rome. In fact, Nero, remember I shared with you Claudius, who was his uncle, who was Caesar before him, banned all the Jews from Rome. One of Nero's first acts was to allow the Jews back into Rome. What a sovereign, perfect time. Because Paul just, he's like, I, I want to go to Rome. So Claudius died, and uh, the saying was, Instead of saying the Caesar died, you say the Caesar became a god. Because they believe when Caesar died, he you know, took his rightful place on Mount Olympus or wherever they thought their gods lived. Um, so that's, that's what's going on in the world. Um, Rome in the first century was a city of about 1.2 million. Huge city. Biggest city in the world. A third of the population were slaves. Um, 
it was just like a modern inner city. They had all the same kind of issues. They had crime. People lived in tenements. There was the wealthy section, then there was the slums. Uh, there was noise 24-7. There was a city that never sleeps. Uh, one of their philosophers <laughs> called it the cesspool of all the world's filth. So, you know, the glory of Rome, as they call it, it was just really being built right now. The Colosseum wasn't built yet. There were some other things in Rome at that time. You've seen the Circus Maximus from Ben-Hur. That was there. This is Palatine Hill. That would have been Nero's palace right there, right above the Circus Maximus. Um, when Nero began his persecutions, this is where Christians were fed to the lions, not at the Colosseum. That happened later, later on. Um, this is the, um, what's called the Forum. You've seen the parades in the movies where the generals came back from war. This is where they would come. That's where the Senate met and where the government uh, would have been. This is an aqueduct. Rome had uh, running water. How many? 260 miles worth of aqueducts supplying 6 million gallons of water a day. So they had running water. They had sewage. They were a pretty modern city. So just imagining Paul or some of these other backwoods Judean fishermen, types showing up at Rome. It would have been like somebody from Perry County going into New York City, which I love doing for field trips, just to see the face when we get out of the car. It would have been like that. So uh, the seed of the church being planted at Rome was already finally getting to ground zero of where the enemy stronghold was in the world. So the church, as Joel was starting to ask about, there were some believers there from Pentecost. There were others who were sent there or at least were known by Paul. You see them in chapter 16. They're named Priscilla and Aquila, his good friends that he had in Ephesus. He sent them on ahead to Rome. Most people believe Priscilla was from Rome. She has a Roman name and probably a strong-willed, wealthy Italian woman. So she may have had a house already for them to, to live in when they got there. There's some others named. There's another one we'll get to, Andronicus and Junia, who were friends of Paul. And he said they're preeminent among the apostles it's one of my favorite little nuggets. You know, every verse in the Bible is important. Janiah is a woman's name. So there is a woman who was an apostle named in the Scriptures. I base a big teaching on women in ministry on that. How can you be an apostle who establishes elders in a church and you can't be an elder in the church? Anyway, we'll get to that when we get to the end. Uh, so yeah, there were five congregations with over 3,000 believers uh, but they hadn't had a visit yet from an apostle of Paul's stature, as far as we know. So likely they were saying, look, we've had some great teaching. We've had the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ brought here. The kingdom of heaven has been established. But Paul, can you send us a letter to introduce us to your doctrine, your teaching, and the impartation that comes of you through you of the kingdom of heaven is world-renowned. So if you can't physically get here yet, could you at least send us a letter so that we could start meditating on it. And that seems to be the heart behind the uh, letter to the Romans. So to get the most out of it, I'm just going to make some recommendations. I know you started already on it. But uh, the first eight chapters are worth the entire price of admission. In fact, if you want to read certain chapters over and over again, just go 5, 6, 7, 8, 5, 6, 7, 8, 5, 6, 7, 8, until you got it about memorized. Chapter 8 especially, you want to ruminate on that chapter. Yeah. And, I mean, he makes the case leading all the way up to it, but chapter 8 is really, I believe, the most important chapter in the whole New Testament. To really understand what this new covenant life is about and really capture the essence of what we are. Roman 8. Um, I recommend you use a paraphrased translation for Romans. It's like I said, it's written like a lawyer making his case, which is really how Paul did it. Uh, so it can be a little confusing in some passages. Sometimes I've read and taught the book several times, and there's certain ones I read it and go, what? Say that again? So I go back and reread it. And you know, I, I still trip over some of his language because he's making this case and jumps around a little bit. Um, so use a paraphrase. That'll really help with this. Um, in your notes, the, as I shared with you at the beginning of the course, your study notes are intentionally very uncluttered. Because I don't want to tell you what the Spirit wants to reveal to you as you read. But for the book of Romans, especially the first eight chapters, it would be really helpful if in that section where I say, you know, what are your questions or revelations and what do you think is the key verse of this part, if you'd write like a two or three sentence summary, what's his point in this section? 
summarize it. It's a great way to meditate on the word, chew on it, and then make it a living word on the inside. This, everybody who teaches knows this, that when you teach something, you've got it now for good. Like if you hear it from somebody, you get a little bit out of it. If you read it, you might get a little bit more. Um, if you live it, you get a little bit more. But as soon as you teach it, it's in there for good. You'll remember it forever. So paraphrasing something is really a form of teaching. It's summing it up and putting it down in Boolean cube format. So if you really want to get a lot out of just even the first, if you want to just do five, six, seven, and eight like that even, that would be worth it to make sure that your inner man gets it, that it's deeply embedded in your spirit because there's so much. Every verse in chapters five, six, seven, and eight, you could preach hours. It is so rich. So anyway, that's my recommendation uh, on how to get the most out of it. Um, Basic outline, this is how we'll be approaching it. The first eight chapters, we call it the uh, case for grace. The question being answered is, how can anybody become and remain justified before God? I'll explain what that term means in a moment. Chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul spends three chapters worth of Scripture dealing with the question, what are we going to do with Israel? They've been God's chosen people for the last 15 centuries. They've carried the promises of God. They have carried the law of God. They've been the only nation on earth that had fellowship with the God of heaven. What are we going to do with them now? Do they have a special place in the new covenant? Do they have, a, a, this is the most controversial three chapters on this subject in there. I have a definite position on it, but I want you to read it before I tell you what it is. So I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> so read it carefully. I'll be seeding some thoughts into you tonight as we read the first three chapters. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just put out there. The question that I put in the notes is, will the real Israel please step forward? So that I'll just leave you with that thought. Then there's uh, four chapters about life in the church, some issues that we've seen covered in other books already. Um, food sacrifice to idols, governing, love, things like that. And then chapter 16, although it's just greetings, it's rich. There's a lot of stuff in there about all kinds of things. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time in that. First eight chapters are the case for grace. This is Paul like a lawyer laying out his case before a jury. First of all, making the case that everybody is guilty of violating the laws of paradise. That nobody deserves to enter into paradise, eternal rest in perfection. He then makes the case for God's grace being exceedingly more powerful than our ability to mess up paradise as long as we receive it and live in it and only trust in it and not our own ability to live up to the measure of paradise. So that's kind of the first eight chapters in a nutshell right there. The first three chapters are the bad news. How many know to understand good news? You have to appreciate the bad news first. This is a part that, you know, for us who are in Christ, we emphasize grace. It's awesome, but there's, there needs to be an understanding that there, not everybody lives forever in paradise. There's like, when we emphasize, and I'm all for it, we emphasize grace, we emphasize new covenant, we emphasize, you know, grace through faith, through Jesus, that it's easy, it, there's no work involved in it, it's just receiving it by faith. But there are still those who won't be in paradise. And there are people who believe that they will be, that won't be. I mean, Jesus told, Jesus, love incarnate, told parables like that, like the sheep and the goats. Some people were surprised. Like, wait a minute, I, I thought I was a sheep. I'm on the goat side. So some of that ought to just at least give us pause. I don't believe in preaching hellfire and brimstone. I don't believe in going out and telling people, you're a sinner. You know, our death comes unexpectedly, like in Pollyanna. That, that kind of preaching, I don't see that it really does any good in the world. But for understanding's sake and for being careful not to slip down a slope, there's some really good teachers people that I've respected in the Lord for a long time, who are now preaching and teaching things like universal salvation, which is that the price Jesus paid on the cross is good enough for everybody. Which is to say, live however you want. You don't need to be born again. You're going to have eternal life no matter what you do. Totally eradicates the need for the cross. Really just tramples and treats the blood of Christ as a common thing, like Hebrews puts it. Tramples the Son of God underfoot. Dangerous doctrine, 
But if you cherry pick a few verses out and share them just right with a smile on your face, it sounds really appealing. So the first three chapters of Romans is designed to make sure, first of all, the people of Paul's day, we'll see the, the Jews and the Gentiles all needed to understand there ain't nobody who can get in on self-righteousness. And that's what it is. It's either righteousness through faith, through grace, or self-righteousness. Those are the only two options. So nobody's justified on their own merit. So the word justified is going to show up a few times. What that word means is justice has been satisfied. So justified doesn't mean that everybody just gets a get-out-of-jail-free card. So the two, there are only two ways. It's a court term. If you come before a judge in a court case because you're accused of a crime, which Paul lays out the case, of course, everybody is guilty of a crime. There's two possibilities, right? If you're the defendant, you can plead guilty or you could plead innocent. If you're innocent, you've got to make your case before the judge that you did not commit the crime. So Paul's going to lay out the case that there ain't nobody who can stand before perfection the standards of paradise, and say, I'm innocent. I've done nothing wrong. The only way anybody could believe they're totally innocent is by moving the goalpost of what paradise standards are. That's the only way. So that's not going to fly. And even the things that we thought we got away with because nobody saw them, we're talking about standing before a judge that even if you perjure yourself in this court, he's going to see right through it. He'll know what your motive was for everything you did. He knows that secret thing that you did that nobody else knew about. So there's, it's not like somebody's got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that we're guilty. The fact is nobody's innocent before that. The other thing is that we could plead guilty, but then we have a problem. Because if you're guilty, you've got to be punished for your crime. So if the judge would say, you're guilty, but I'm going to let you go. I'm just going to let you go free. That's an unrighteous judge that judge has basically said, there's no such thing as a standard either. I'll move the goalpost for you. You're free to go. You committed murder. You seem to be sorry for it. All right, you can go. There's no justice in that. Nobody wants to live in a world with no justice. The only people who care about living in a world with no justice are the ones who've never lost anything they've loved and suffered an injustice. Everybody, we have an inner drive for justice. You watch a movie where guys, you know, dictators are doing their thing, Hitler's doing his thing. You can't wait for him to get it in the end. If they don't get it in the end, there's something deeply embedded in us. It's like, ah, can I rewrite the ending of that movie? The bad guy didn't get caught. There's a justice thing because we're made in the image of God, and God is just. He doesn't change the standards. So what does justified mean? If justice is satisfied, it means that what we can do is plead, our case before the court? How? See ya. We'll look at that. First three chapters. I know you know the answer already because you read the letter, but that's the case. So that's basically the framework for the first three chapters. We're in the courtroom now, and, and there's like this dramatic tension that's being built. How can anybody ever stand before this judge and walk away alive? Nobody makes it out of this courtroom alive. Or can they? Is there something that's been provided? Of course, we already know the answer because we read the end of the book. But that's how Paul presents it. All right, so let's, let's dive into Romans 1. Any questions about that? That was kind of an overview before we really dive in and we'll, we'll get as far as we can in this. Okay. All right, so chapter 1 is some greetings. He's expressing his desire to come to them. Any insight or revelation about that? He made an awesome statement there. Uh, I long to see you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you, this is verse 11, that you might be established. So in other words, there's some things you can't get via letter. There's some things you can't get by podcast, by YouTube, by even Bethel TV. There's some things you just can't get when the, the imparter is not present. There are certain things that have to come through the laying on of hands, through person-to-person -person interaction in the body of Christ. So, I, I really grieve for those who say, you know, I have church at home by watching TV. You're missing out on so much. You're missing out on a lot of the impartation God wants to give you because the kingdom has transferred life to life, not just mouth to mouth. It's interesting, though, like, is that more just for, like, mantle-type impartation? Because you have examples like, 
Peter's shadow, them sending handkerchiefs. Mm -hmm. I mean, hear testimonies of people calling <coughs> yeah. someone and saying, hey, we're praying for this, and they get healed. It's yeah. like, you know, so obviously there is a, yeah. there's a transference without the touch, but... Yeah. But I do also, you know, mm -hmm. see the thing with the laying on of hands. Well. No, that's a great point. God for sure is not restricted. Amen. You know, if like, like I says in Romans 10, how shall they hear if none preaches to them? But we were getting all these testimonies out of the Middle East of Jesus just showing up, uh, you know, physically showing up in front of Muslims. So nobody went and preached to them. Jesus said, I'm not going to wait. I'm just going to show up. So, yeah, by all means, he, he can do it any way he wants to. Um, I mean, even with the shadow, that was Peter's presence. That the word shadow, by the way, doesn't just mean like the shade from the sun shining on Peter. It literally refers to like an aura without getting too new agey about it. It's the spirit life around him. Like how the woman with the issue of blood just touched Jesus' garment. He didn't have anything to do with it. He just carried such a measure of the spirit that just touching his clothes could heal. And that's the same thing with Paul's do-rag. In the marketplace, you know, his sweat rag had the power to heal, but it, you had to touch that thing. You know, it wasn't like I heard that Paul has a rag, you know, as soon as you touched it. Uh, just so we all know, that wasn't like a model for, I mean, you could buy those online. Who knows, man, if that's what God does, God will do it because he loves us any way that we need it done. But you're right. I think where you're getting at is that his primary way to make us interdependent on one another and to make sure that we remain a body that's actually physically connected with one another, not just, you know, through distance. Um, like Paul said, I want to see you. I want to get to you. Because of some things I've got to impart in person so that you could be established. So yeah, I mean, mantle gifts, offices, for sure, it always comes with the laying on of hands. But I don't know if Paul was restricting it just to that. He's speaking to the church. I want to establish you. There's some things that I could bring in person that I can't send by letter to establish you in Christ. Now, there's a measure of gift that I carry. We don't know exactly what he meant I think when by you that. Write a letter or even like a text. <clears throat> you mm -hmm. can misinterpret it. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody face to face. Oh, absolutely. I want to see their expression. I want to hear their tone and their voice. Yeah. There, there is all that, right, in most communications, nonverbal, but there's also a spirit to spirit thing that happens when we're with somebody. Mm -hmm. You can sense somebody's spirit, even if it's not necessarily written on their countenance. Uh, you know, if a testimony is of people who are locked in prison, and they could tell that there's a believer in the next cell. They can't see him. It's not like they're hearing him singing. They just know. I'm in the presence of another believer. There's like the spirit-to-spirit -spirit transfer that goes on as we get close to one another. So, uh, yeah, there's some powerful stuff with that. Um, but, yeah, you're right, Steve. Thanks for balancing that out. Uh, for sure, God will do it any way at all, but there's some things that just really have to be done person to person, life to life. Okay, so what did you think about this section? 18 to 32, he's making the case about how everybody's guilty, even if they've never heard the gospel message. This is the passage that really answers that eternal question. How is it fair that God would judge somebody who's never heard the gospel? If there's only one name by which men can be saved, what about the guy deep in the bush who never had a chance? How is God going to judge them? And that's answered in this passage. How does that... What's that? Why does he abandon them? Well, we're reading here that he doesn't. Mm -hmm. That he's got another way. He, he does judge based on something else for those who haven't heard somebody, a messenger preach the gospel. Through creation itself. Okay, so we have the evidence of creation, right? Mm -hmm. It reflects his nature. In verse 20, I saw a parallel there. It says about that, um, for ever since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through His workmanship. And I thought about how Jesus said, you know, mm. not to believe me, but believe the works. the works themselves. That's right. They testify for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the obviousness of if there's something created, there must have been a creator. You know what, uh, what? I'm going to be really careful not to geek out on you. I'm still a science geek. I just got Michael Behe's new book. I'm reading it. He's a guy, you ever hear of the intelligent design movement? I was a biology major when I started in college, so I'm still geeky about this stuff. And I'm mad because I believed evolution explained the origins of life for a long time. 
I'm so mad that I believe that now. I'm like, how could I have fallen for that? And it's just absurd to think that the kind of order and precision and design in the universe came about all by itself. It's as ridiculous as when you go in your room and your, your two-year-old's in the room and there's like crayon art all over the wall and marker on their face and you go and you go, how'd this happen? Oh no, it's just there. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. Come on. We know who did it. And it, it feels like that. So that is the standard that God says, look, my qualities, all of my nature were revealed in nature. That's why we call it nature, I think. My nature is revealed in nature. You can tell everything you need to know about me. Um, so, and, and then at the end of it, in verse 32, this is what we call the law of conscience, although they know the ordinance of God. So this isn't speaking about the Jews. This is Gentiles at this point. So there's a law written on our conscience. People know good and bad. There's certain rules that every tribe, tongue, and nation's always had. You don't kill people. I mean, you don't murder people. You don't steal. You don't, you know, cheat on your wife. For the most part, there's some norms throughout cultures. There's a conscience in there. So God will hold us to the standard of our conscience. Did you obey your conscience or did you choose evil even though your heart knew it was wrong? for you to do that. So those are two things listed in there. Yeah. Um, I had kind of the same question of what Lo had just said. It actually says it in the Amplified in, in uh, verses 24 yeah. um, and 26. It says, Therefore God gave, gave them, them over in the lust of their own hearts. And then at, at the end of that, in the Amplified, it says, Abandoning them to the de- degrading power of sin. And then in verse 26, again, it says, For this reason, God gave them over to degrading and vile passions. And that was like... And then if you go over to chapter 2, verse 4, it's like it talks about God's patience and His long-suffering and all that. Yeah. So was it just that, you know, over and over, and they just refused to... Yeah. I mean, it does seem, as you read through the Old Testament, you know, all the prophets had the same story. Again and again, I reached out to you in love. Again and again, I appealed to you. Turn, turn, turn. And then finally, I let you have what you've clearly said you wanted all along. And that's kind of the feeling of it. Because the reason why he gave them over, he gave them over to impurity, to degrading passions, and to a depraved mind. Because although, you know, since the creation is invisible, attributes were seen, they knew God, but they didn't honor him or give him thanks. So they became futile, in their conclusions, speculations, conclusions. And professing to be wise, they became fools and they worshiped the creation rather than the Creator. So they willingly shook their fist at God, even though God's judgment of it is that they saw me clearly and rejected me. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, but they kept doing it continually. They saw me, but they chose the other tree instead. But they continued to choose the other tree. I reached out to them and they continued to choose the other tree. So finally, I gave them over. As we know from reading Paul before, if somebody's handed over to Satan, what's the purpose of it? Yeah, I mean, eventually, and we see this throughout history, that cultures get so depraved, like Rome itself was like this. Rome was so depraved in those first three centuries A.D. that once the kingdom flipped it around, Most of Rome were believers overnight. I mean, it was revealed that Rome had come to it. And the martyrs in the early church and the the testimony of the Christians was such a light because it was so dark out. So even, you know, if you're speaking specifically about the Romans who were around them, I mean, boy, were they one of the most debaucherous cultures of all time. I mean, celebrating pornography in the streets and open stuff like that. Yeah, I had it written down like all three times there where it says... 20, 22, 24, or no, it was 18 and 19, was it? 18, 19, and 20. But then where it says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And I was starting to think about, I have it written here too, that what you were saying earlier, think of the politicians. Put that right there. Some of the ones thinking they're wise, killing babies. Yeah. I mean, just total opposite. They became fools. Yeah. So what they're, yeah. What's the abortion? So when it says that God gave them over, it doesn't mean God hardened their hearts and forced them to do these things. It's that God said, I'm going to remove my preventing grace from you so you could just finally hit rock bottom where there's nowhere else to look but up. That's basically the picture, I think, of that. So in 21 it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, 
and neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, yeah. and their foolish heart was darkened. Yeah. So with all of creation that spoke of God, they didn't see it as God. Yeah. Yeah. So he said it, they had a choice to believe in God then. You know, yeah. I'm going to give you what you want. Yeah. So he, like you said, yeah, he more or less gave them what they wanted. They wanted believe otherwise and, and you run into it yeah. again and there's a chapter nine with Pharaoh it says God yeah. Pharaoh's yeah. yeah. Finally it's like all right I'm not gonna give you a chance to turn back now because you've gone too far and we're gonna see this all the way through. He kinda like gave them the choice and they continued to choose evil. Mm-hmm. And so he says, Okay, I will give you what you're choosing instead of mm. giving you what I'm offering which is better than what you're choosing, but yeah, like the free, cho- free will. Yeah. Given free will. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's just cementing that free will with Pharaoh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see God as the perfect gentleman. You know, he will. He he loves them. He he. You know, his, his love never stopped for them. Mm-hmm. His love doesn't stop for us. And yeah. We do have the free will, and that's where it comes into play. They chose to walk mm-hmm. away, and you know, he, he can't in his righteousness and his glory can't have communion or fellowship with darkness so Mm -hmm. it's right even though he pursued them to a degree he was still that father that said to the prodigal Mm -hmm. son here you go yeah go have your way that's right and then Mm -hmm. he didn't chase after yeah but patiently waited for him to come back and made every opportunity and made sure the door is wide open and i won't even make you come all the way just let me see your face again and Mm -hmm. your mind again yeah, I mean, that's, uh, so uh, in part, it's like, you know, a, a foil, like how you put a diamond in a setting so that the diamond shows more glorious. Mm-hmm. The bad news like this, the darkness that there is without Christ, the darkness that is outside the kingdom of God, what Jesus, love incarnate, introduces hell is real. Mm-hmm. But because we understand that, it just makes the richness of his grace all the more beautiful. Because as dark as it is without him, as chaotic and empty and void as it is without him, is even more glorious about his, how his grace breaks through and how his grace makes life worth living like that. So, um, all right, I was hoping to finish getting through all the bad news tonight so we could just get into the good news next week. But we'll, we'll pick up next week in chapter two. How's that? I don't want to keep you after eight, I promised. We would end at eight. But any questions? We're finished with chapter one. So, any questions remaining from that chapter? <clears throat> yeah. What does it mean when it says the, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven? Mm. <clears throat> okay, that's a great question. <laughs> Can we pick that up next time? Yeah. Okay, because it'll, it'll tie into the next chapter. Oh, I'll remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can tell you what it, what it does not mean is that as Paul was writing to the Romans, God was about to pour out hellfire and brimstone on everybody because of this. That's not what it means. So basically the wrath of God being revealed is because His grace is being revealed. Now we understand just how dark it really was. Like the veil's been lifted at at the terrifying situation we were in. Like we just had our eyes... I remember um, I was backpacking. I'll just tell the story and then move on. And then we'll go I was backpacking through the Catskill Mountains, and we, we, had to, we wanted to sleep on top of this one mountain. It's about 5,000 feet up, with beautiful cliffs. We really wanted to be there for the sunrise, but we were goofing around, and we were only halfway up when the sun went down, so we finished the rest of the climb in the dark. So we found a spot that looked like, oh, cool, we could see the valley when the sun comes up. We figured out which way was east, and we slept on this rock right, right there. When I woke up in the morning to the sun just beginning to break the sky, my feet were hanging over the edge of a hundred foot drop. Oh my word. Which I couldn't tell at night. It looked like we were pretty safe back. And I don't move around a lot when I sleep. And so, so I was terrified. I thought, oh my, I almost died. I almost died to watch the sunrise. This is stupid. But that picture just came to mind about the wrath of God being revealed is that now that grace has come, now that this new covenant's in effect, we realize just how terrible it actually was. Well, we all thought it was okay and safe. Now we recognize, wow, man, that was a close call. Praise God for His exceeding grace right now because we didn't even realize what was coming our way. So that, that's really, you know, for the, this, to the Gentiles who that's being spoken, 
you guys thought you were having this party life. You didn't even realize you were hanging over the edge of a cliff. So now that the good news has come, you're without excuse. And now is the time for you to turn and receive grace. The free grace that's been extended to you. I was going to answer you next time, but I thought that just came to me and I'm not going to remember to write it down. So I'll take the word as it, as it comes and flows. So I'll leave it there. All right. So honestly, next week, guys, I could tell you right now, we are not going to get past Romans 8 next week. So don't bother reading beyond that if you're already pressed to catch up. If you are keeping up with the reading, by all means, finish out Romans, which is what we were supposed to do tonight. <laughs> so by all means keep reading if you want to but if you needed a break to catch your breath because we just read the three biggest books in the new testament all back to back so i know that's a lot of reading that we've done more than more than the usual so we won't get past romans 8 next week all right all right see you then love you guys have an awesome time good i love those heresy questions Yes, let me shut this off real quick.